Hi, my name is Lisa Schmidt, and I am a TMJ implant patient. I am married and the mother of two young adults. I have a bachelor's degree in clinical laboratory sciences from the University of Massachusetts. Before my TMJ surgeries, I had a career working at NASA. I worked on developing training materials and trained the astronauts and cosmonauts on specific pieces of hardware for the Mir space station and shuttle missions. <clears throat> it all started in 1999 when the primary care physician sent me to an orthodontist to have a splint made for my migraines. The splint pushed my jaw back, causing the disc to go out of place and I could not open my jaw. <clears throat> Then I was sent to an oral surgeon who recommended I have arthroscopic surgery. After the surgery, he suggested we fix my bite, which led to a second set of braces and upper and lower jaw surgery. At this point, my joints rapidly degenerated and he suggested removing my discs. When the surgery failed, my, <clears throat> my mandible quickly fused to my skull. When I discussed with him that I, was, I, that I had gradually worsened through all of these surgeries, and asked what his next plan was. He told me that my small children and I were the reason for the, small, for the failed surgeries and said that I needed psychiatric help. That is when I became depressed and began to look for another surgeon to help me. <clears throat> the second surgeon performed a bilateral total joint replacement. After this surgery, my upper and lower jaw did not come together and he revised the position of the mandibular components Again, my bite was off and he made me get a third set of braces and this time the surgical procedure was reasonably successful. These joints functioned about 12 years, but over time the pain increased. Gradually, I lost all of my hair to an autoimmune disease which was caused by metal sensitivity. In 2015, I developed swelling, a bite change, and increased pain the immunologist ordered an orthopedic analysis panel and diagnosed me with metal sensitivity to nickel. The surgeon who removed the TMJ implants left me jointless. My jaw rolled back and I developed severe obstructive sleep apnea. To correct this new jaw position, the surgeon offered me the option of doing a rib graft or distraction osteogenesis surgery. I told him I didn't know which would, wor which would work and asked for his expert opinion. After a CT scan, he said distraction osteogenesis would be my best option. In January um, of 2016, I underwent digitally planned nine and a half hour surgery to place the distraction hardware in a Lafort procedure. One week later, I was told that the hardware was not placed correctly and that I needed surgery the next day. Two days after the surgery, I was admitted to the hospital for multifocal pneumonia, sepsis, and symptomatic anemia. I was hospitalized for six days. My hematocrit dropped to 20% and I was given two blood transfusions. At this point, I was required to use a screwdriver to move the distraction hardware every 12 hours for 20 days. It was so painful that I could only lay there in extreme pain with tears rolling down my cheeks. July 2016, the surgeon told me that he needed to do another Lefort procedure because he had brought my upper jaw down too low and that he would do a mandibular osteotomy to fix my anterior open bite. Instead, he placed the upper jaw in a position to meet my malformed lower jaw and he decided against doing the mandibular osteotomy. He placed the Lefort hardware and screws in the orbits of my eyes. This caused excruciating eye pain. This was done without my knowledge, discussion, or consent. He did not even tell me that he did the procedure. My pain management physician found the screws there and when he ordered an x-ray. <clears throat> One of my other physicians likened my experience with this surgeon to torture. I was his victim. At this point, I began seeking the opinions of three other oral maxillofacial surgeons across the country. I have now learned that the turning distraction hardware that stuck out of my neck caused me to have a lifelong swallowing disorder called oropharyngeal dysphagia. To this day, I easily aspirate on food and liquids. 
This is a photo of me prior to the second total joint replacement with the third surgeon. This x-ray shows my severe anterior open bite after my failed surgeries. In February 2017, I had my second total joint replacement. My current surgeon told me he felt doing another Lefort would be dangerous. He even told me his, his goal was to first do no harm. It was reassuring to hear a surgeon say he wanted to help me without causing me more harm. My mandible did not come forward enough because of the position of my maxilla. So December of 2017, we decided that a sliding genioplasty would bring my chin forward and improve the sleep apnea. At this time, I continued to deal with a mild anterior open bite from orthodontic relapse. I continue to have sleep apnea, but it is managed well with a BiPAP machine. I am now able to eat and maintain a healthy diet and weight. My quality of life has improved. However, I'm concerned about my future overall health and particularly, particularly about the future TMJ joint <laughs> restorations. Perhaps the most important finding about TMD is that it is a complex condition and patients have multiple comor comorbid conditions. This dictates <clears throat> And that to gain an understanding of TMD, research should not be conducted in silos and a new treatment team model should be developed for optimal patient care. I will share with you the conditions I had before and after TMJ treatment. So before I had migraines, asthma, Ehlers-Danlos, even though it wasn't diagnosed till last year, and hypothyroidism. My comorbid comorbidities after TMD surgeries, chronic pain, facial nerve pain, neck pain, migraine headaches, dysautonomia, running nose, watery eyes and pots, ear pain, vertigo, tinnitus. I have permanent tubes due to eustachian tube dysfunction, oropharyngeal dysphagia, obstructive sleep apnea, which caused me to develop a right bundle branch block in my heart, chronic fatigue, malocclusion, I have autoimmune conditions, malnutri malnutrition, which caused my gallbladder disease due to rapid weight loss when I was being wired shut, severe gum recession, and my teeth, the roots of my teeth have resorbed from the braces and being wired shut. And I um, also think that there's possibly a compromised blood supply to my gum and teeth. Okay. Chronic fatigue makes it difficult for me to maintain friendships and participate in activities with family. Many activities are limited due to my chronic condition. Simply bending over to pick something up can trigger a severe headache. Intimacy is challenging for my husband and me due to fear of hurting my face and significant fatigue. Even a kiss can be difficult due to the numbness of my lips and chronic pain. My mother-in-law had to come and stay with us many times to help with the children as I recovered from surgeries. My husband had to switch jobs to get insurance that would cover TMJ surgery. He had to manage insurance claims, pay for travel to seek treatment for TMD. My family has had to watch my health decline over the years. We had the financial burden of many orthodontic treatments, splints, and other dental treatments and travel expenses. My re medical research training career with NASA was cut short because of my severe chronic pain after having a bilateral total joint replacement. Ethical concerns in this area <clears throat> could be due to the lack of scientific research that results in evidence-based treatment. Without evidence-based treatment, guidelines for professionals to adhere to leaves the profession unaccountable for the problems that may arise. It is not uncommon to hear of patient abandonment or patient blame when the treatment worsens this condition. The consent process is open-ended and allows the surgeon to have free reign to make an undiscussed decision with the patient while under anesthesia. Ironically, I was unable to bring a legal suit against the surgeon who harmed me due to Amos Code of Ethics or the American Association of Maxillofacial Surgeons and I have the Code of Ethics there. The state in which the surgery was per performed requires that the current treating physician either testify or make a statement in the case. According to the Amos Code of Ethics, the current treating physician may serve as a fact witness if he, if he or she testifies from firsthand knowledge 
of the condition of the patient and the treatment provided. The physician is not allowed, according to the Code of Ethics, to render an opinion as to the appropriateness, appropriateness of the treatment provided. This Code of Ethics is an oxymoron. Even if the physician feels morally bound to support a patient who has been harmed by previous treatments, to do so would result in being censured or to have their license revoked. I also filed a complaint with the State Dental Board. I found out that the surgeon who reviewed my case was an alumnus of the same university where the surgeon who harmed me is on staff. I call this chaos and controversy in care. TMD patients seek treatment from a broad array of differing professions, <clears throat> professionals. This is a result of the uncertainty and controversy that abounds in the field and the failure of therapies to address the pain and dysfunction that accompanies this condition. This quote is from the TMJ patient-led roundtable briefing, and the report can be found on the MD EpiNet website. <clears throat> Working Group 3 of the TMJ patient-led roundtable reviewed 24 different organizations that claim to treat TMD. Of these, the American Association of Dental Research, the Academy of Orofacial Pain, and the Association of Oral and Maxofacial Surgeons had published information for treating TMD, but no formal guidelines had been developed. There is an urgent need to develop treatment guidelines for temporal mandibular disorders. A multidisciplinary team needed, needs to be developed to address this complex condition, and it might consist of primary care, internal medicine, otolaryngology, dentistry, OMFS, pain, med pain medicine, rheumatology, neurology, sleep medicine, allergy and immunology, psychiatry, genetics, physiatry, and ancillary services such as nutritional counseling, speech therapy, and cognitive therapy. The team must be patient-centered and dedicated to coordinating treatments and care decision. This multidisciplinary team should establish patients' pre-existing conditions, which could determine the course of treatment and their outcomes. In summary, right now, the TMJ arena is akin to the wild, wild west. And just for fun, every multidisciplinary team needs a fur therapy support, and these are my babies. <laughs> um, I was asked to discuss research, since this is the panel. Um, and until now, I have never been asked to participate in a research study or clinical trial as a TMD patient. At this point, I'm stable and apprehensive about taking risks. I would have to think long and hard and would have to know every detail about the research study before making a decision. And I thought this was appropriate. My husband's namesake, we kind of joked about this. He had it hanging at his house. If you mess with a thing long enough, it will break. And that's Schmidt's law. <laughs> um, as far as reading. As a TMJ patient and one who talks with many others, we are constantly asking questions and wondering about many aspects of this problem. We have a million questions and we would like, that we would like scientists to answer. I would personally like to suggest some of these questions that I have for them. And I was thinking, does asthma or allergies make a patient more prone to metal allergies? Why do some patients develop biofilm infections with the implants? Does a positive HLA B27 test make a patient more likely to have failed TMJ surgery or failed TJR? Um, why do many patients that have a total joint replacement develop autoimmunity? What genetic testing should be done to determine a, su a successful outcome? For example, Ehlers-Danlos. I had that and wasn't even diagnosed until the age of 47. Does this patient have risk factors for developing chronic regional pain syndrome? How, <clears throat> how does long-term metal exposure affect the patient's health? How do hormones impact this condition? Patients with TMD are predominantly women. There are so many more questions that we could contribute towards scientific research. Um, when I began my TMJ journey with a bite splint, I could never have envisioned how dramatically my life would change. The, fir the first few treatments I anticipated with hope, but the hope gradually changed to fear. 
uncertainty, and desperation. I have no hope for improvement, just anxiety for how much worse I will get. How many more surgeries are in my future? Will I suffer the long-term effects of the device materials? And how short will my life be? As dismal as my story is, and the enormity of what this whole area of TMD needs, we actually have embarked on this change. All stakeholders have come to the TMJ patient-led roundtable. We already have some successes to tout, and everyone is committed to working together for the benefit of TMJ, um, for the TMJ patient. And I will leave you with this quote by Leon M. Letterman, who's uh, an experimental physicist. Science is not about status quo. It's about revolution. And it's time that we move out of that rut. Thank you. Thank you.